All right, hi, welcome back, Tony Steve Andrian. Thanks for watching us. We got another exciting video today about RICO. RICO, the corrupt organizations. I'm gonna give you a general overview. I'm gonna to try to cram it into 10 minutes or less. Good luck, I don't always make it. But this is kind of the basics, the frameworks that you need to know about RICO, how the, how the statute works. And this used to be the law that they used, used to bring down the mobsters. This was passed in 1970, signed by Richard Nixon, of all people. And, uh, and this was designed to bring down the mobsters because prior to that, they had to go and sue every single mobster individually, and it became a big hassle. So they passed a law in 1970 to say, we got to have a better way to do this. We got to be able to go after these enterprises, these corrupt enterprises, go after the people that are associated with it, the enterprise itself, and do it in one action. And that's why we have the RICO law. So without further ado, let's head to the Attorney Steve litigation whiteboard. All right, so um, this is RICO. This is going to be a, as quick as I can do for an overview. This is general legal information only, not legal advice. This is not going to cover all the nuances. There are so many nuances. It can depend on the jurisdiction that you're in, your state law. It depends on so many things, okay? So this is just a general overview, and let's leave it at that, okay? So what do we have here, RICO? I'm trying to break this down for you. For, if you're a law student, do you have a RICO on your exam? You have the RICO Enterprise. This is comprised of some kind of enterprise. It can be people. It can be an organization, a corporation. As I note here, it could be an, a legal or an illegal organization, such as Enron. If you all remember Enron, that was a legal organization for a, quite some time until you know what happened, the House of Cards. Um, and we have cases like the Varsity Blues. If you guys haven't seen that, check out my video. It's really good on the Varsity Blues. Um, it's about it's the college cheating scandal where you had this RICO organization of schools, all these top schools, USC, UCLA, um, Harvard, Stanford, Yale, all these companies trying to get their kids in, the famous actors trying to get their kids into these great schools without having the credentials, okay? So I did a video on that. You got to watch it if you don't know anything about it. It's pretty fascinating just to begin with. So it could be all kinds of different associations of people and entities trying to do a common enterprise, common purpose, and doing illegal things as we have under the act here. So a real quick way to think of the RICO statute is you have the enterprise, you need a violation of two or more of these predicate acts that we'll talk about in a second, and it needs to constitute a pattern of racketeering activity, a pattern, okay? There has to be some kind of pattern, not isolated. There has to be some sort of arrangement and, and connections, continuity and relationship as we talk about. And so if you have this and this and this, and you meet one of the grounds for liability over here, which I'll talk about, 1962A to D, you have one of those liability grounds and you have these predicate acts, ongoing uh, criminal enterprise, racketeering, shall we say, racketeering enterprise, then you can get over here to damages. The damages can be both criminal liability for the actors up to 20 years, possibly more, uh, 25,000 in fines and fees, forfeiture of assets, things like that. And importantly, in my world, civil lawsuits and civil lawsuits can be up to three times treble, treble damages. So if you have, if you lost $100,000, it could be 300,000 plus attorney fees, so forth and so on, okay? So it's a nice statute. This says shall award three times. That's what makes it really nice. That's why we are seeing some trade secret cases brought under this section, okay? What I call criminal IP. So let's start back here at the beginning. So you have the organization and excuse me here. You have the organization and it can be insiders, your officers, your directors, your officials, board of directors, anybody that's involved or associated in the common enterprise that's performing these racketeering predicate acts, um, common purpose. And there can be some kind of structure. It doesn't have to be a formal um, hierarchy, but some kind of structure to the organization so that it actually can be perceived as an organization. And you may have some outsiders as well, your accountants, your lawyers. Now, a lot of times these accountants, lawyers, auditors, they'll try to say, well, we're just separate, we're not part of that. And that may be true. They may be what's called a true outsider, but they could also be deemed maybe like a partial outsider, someone that's engaging in the, the uh, 
the servicing, uh, providing bogus services. Okay. Just, yeah, right. Sure. That was an audit. Yeah. Doubt it. That was pretty, you didn't see all those red flags. That's horrific. Um, or they're intertwined or they're engaged in managerial decisions or these outsiders were essential to pulling off the predicate acts. Okay. So that is just real loosely. You need an enterprise in these RICO cases, some kind of enterprise. There it is. Um, and, and again, like I said, it could be legal or illegal entity. It could be uh, some drug traffickers. It could be, uh, the cartels. It could be all, you know, human traffickers, anything. Okay. Um, so that's real quick, real basic general, what we're talking about with an enterprise violation of two or more predicate acts. So it could be two, two of these could be one of these could be a combination of two or more could be 50, could be a hundred different acts could be anything. Pleading is really important in these cases. You want to plead everything you know with specificity, especially if you're dealing with fraudulent type of conduct. Fraud usually needs to be pled to a higher standard, clear and convincing, very specific factual allegations. So pleading is, is a very, definitely an art form in here. So let's take a look at these predicate acts. If you say we got the relation, we got the enterprise, I'm not concerned. We have the enterprise here, piece of cake. We need to look at section 1961. The law falls under 18 USC, United States Code, 1961 to 1968. Down here, 1961, there's two different ways. There's actually five different ways. This section goes to section G, but a lot of those things are not commonly litigated. So I'm going to talk about the ones that are commonly litigated. Section A and Section B. These are violations of state law. These are violations of specific federal laws under Title 18 of the United States Code. So let's start over here. Um, the state statutes, they're looking for two or more predicate acts within 10 years. Note that within a 10-year period, okay? Um, and that's why we talk about there need, it needs to be some kind of pattern, not just, you know, one over here, one over here. This was this, that was that. There needs to be some sort of pattern of racketeering conduct. But I broke this down for you. I made a little, what do you call it, mnemonic or whatever. Um, brockage, okay? Brockage. These are the main state laws. These are things that are, I think we can all agree, are just horrible, horrible things to commit. And if these are basically what we call an act or a threat, punishable by one year or more in jail, that's what we call felony, um, any of these would qualify for a predicate act, okay, these indictable acts. <coughs> so I have them down here, brockage. If you're wondering what brockage means, it's a coin that was improperly minted. Don't ask me why I picked this. I thought I had it, and then I forgot murder, so I had to throw murder down there extra. But brockage, burglary, robbery, obscenity, trafficking in, in obscene child porn materials, things like that. Um, trafficking in controlled substances, drugs, and fentanyl, now the big one, right? Kidnapping, taking people across state lines, doing these kinds of things. And, and by the way, let me point out real quick that this, being a federal law, does require interstate commerce. So make sure you're pleading that. Interstate commerce, I see. Um, but arson, gambling, gambling's this big one, interstate gambling rackets and things like that. Extortion, of course, that's what everybody always says. That's extortion. They're extorting me. That's RICO. Okay, it could be. Yes, it could be. Yes, it could be. And murder, of course, these, you know, mobsters and gangsters and crime families, you know, killing people off. Bang, bang, you're gone. Um, these will qualify as a predicate act. These will qualify as a predicate act. These state laws, there's a list of about 35 of them. Okay, not going to go over all of them. I'm going over the juicy ones, the juicy ones. Uh, the criminal IP, as I mentioned, if you're stealing uh, copyrighted stuff, transporting, ma making manufacturer uh, software, things like that, or stealing. <laughs> Sorry. That's my wife calling. Anyway, I'll get to her later. Got to finish my work first. Um, trade secrets is another one. Um, stealing trade secrets. Um, criminal level, theft of trade secrets, bribery, witness tampering, uh, mail and wire fraud. This is the frequent one you see all the time. Mail and wire fraud, okay? 
um, doing illegal things through the phone lines and the email lines and everything else. Money laundering, of course, the big one. Everybody always talks about money laundering, right? Um, tampering with witnesses. Uh, I have here uh, interstate chop shops, stealing a car, taking it across, chopping it into pieces, trying to make money those kinds of things, and trafficking, these are what I call the juicy ones. These are the ones you see on TV. You go, wow, that's juicy. You know, that's really juicy. But theft and fraud and those kinds of things, and there's there's a bunch of other ones. If, you, if you're not finding it here, check out Title 18, see the, the full list, see if it fits in there. But so if you have two or more of these predicate acts, um, and it constitutes a pattern of racketeering conduct, now, I'm not going to go into specific details on this, but I did want to read you this here in case you're saying, well, what the heck does he mean, continuity and relationship? I mean, what's that mean? I'm just going to read you this here. Um, it is not necessary to prove that the racketeering acts always be similar in nature or directly related to each other, but rather a pattern of racketeering activity may be found if the predicate acts are related to the activities of the alleged enterprise, okay, related to the activities. The racketeering acts furthered the goals of or benefited the enterprise. Um, two, the enterprise or the defendant's role in the enterprise enabled the defendant to commit or facilitated the commission of the racketeering acts. Three, the racketeering acts were committed at the behest of or on behalf of the enterprise. And or four, the racketeering acts had the same or similar purposes, results, participants, victims, or methods of commission. Now, this can get really down in the weeds with open and closed and all this other stuff. I'm not going to take you down to the weeds. Let's keep it friendly. Let's keep it, let's keep it uh, easy to understand here. But that's it. So, I mean, um, if you have these things, all you need to do is, is look here. And then here's your grounds for liability and your prohibited uh, activities, your liability grounds. 1962, under the statute, sections A through D, you have um, 1962A, investing in an enterprise. That's not real common. Um, so in other words, a plaintiff, plaintiff would have to allege and argue, I was uh, injured by an investment in an enterprise. Uh, 1962B, as in biscuit, acquiring or maintaining an interest in an enterprise. I was injured by that. Not very likely, possible, but not likely. But the big ones here, 62, 1962C, and 1962D, as in docket. Okay, C is uh, activities dealing with conducting the affairs conducting the affairs of the organization, engaging in these predicate acts, which are a pattern or practice. And RICO, conspiracy, the section D, this is a big one. All you need here is the agreement. You don't need, like you do in uh, the torts law, the overt act. If they agree to do it, and they, you're trying to commit it, and this, that, and the other, that can be a RICO conspiracy. So you could bring in all kinds of people here, insiders, outsiders that are not really truly outsiders. Um, so there you have it. And there's your grounds for liability. There's your sections, your code sections. I think I did it under 10 minutes. You got everything there. So I hope you've enjoyed this. This is Rico explained is faster than anybody can explain it. Attorney Steve helping you out here, especially you bar takers. I love when you guys post comments and you say, thank you. You saved me, man. Uh, but that's a general, real general overview, not legal advice. There's tons of nuances and everywhere else can depend what the part of the country you're in and so forth and so on. So thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Attorney Steve, civil litigation, intellectual property law. Appreciate you watching. Feel free to share this video on your social media networks. Have a great day. Got to run. Got to call my wife. <laughs> Bye now.